All right. Well, thanks for coming, guys, and uh, welcome to Automated Cloud Native Incident Response with Kubernetes and Service Mesh. Uh, Matt and I will introduce ourselves uh, momentarily. For now, we would like to thank the Cloud Native Computing Foundation event team for yet another great KubeCon. My friend. Cool. So I'm Matt Turner. I'm a software engineer at Tetrate. We are a company that looks at uh, helping enterprises with identity-based application micro-segmentation. So we use Istio and Envoy and all those techs as an implementation detail to help you scale your organization and scale your security as you've got multiple clusters, multiple regions, multiple meshes. And I'm Francesco, I'm a security engineering manager at Control Plane. I spent a few years at university, then I moved into the IT, OT security spaces. Then I stood up the uh, security operation center and incident response capability for a large satellite mobile provider. I uh, work for Control Plane now because I didn't want to see a network cable anymore in my life. Uh, Control Plane is a cloud native security consultancy established in 2017, based in London, but we have offices in North America and APAC as well security specialists in Kubernetes, uh, container, and open source in general. We, we train on all the above as well. And we focus on deeply threat modeled uh, secure by design and secure by default uh, cloud native architectures. And more recently, we stood up a new service, which consists of uh, helping customers bridging the gap between infrastructure, cloud native infrastructure, and uh, uh, security operations. So what will we be talking about today? We'll go through some basic concepts about security incident response uh, to make sure that people in the room, uh, they have the, again, the basic concept, uh, they, we speak a common language. And then we'll uh, um, go through a story where uh, in organizations more recently start adopting a, a more proactive approach to incident response and, bring, and brought some automation as well to help them counter attacking. And then uh, the fun will begin. Matt will uh, walk you through some uh, cloud native technology and concepts uh, through an incident response lens and then there will be a walkthrough literally of a response on a reference architecture on a kubernetes uh, um, cluster cool so apologies to the security professionals in the room but we have to do this so uh, i'll start from the uh, definitions that most professionals uh, disagree on uh, incident and response uh, i like these two uh, incident uh, an event uh, that could lead uh, to the loss of or disruption to an organization's operations, data, services, or functions. A security incident is an event that may indicate that an organization, system, or data have been compromised, or that measures put in place to protect them have failed. Response to such incidents, uh, a set of people, process, technology to identify, contain, eliminate, and recover from such events. What do we mean with uh, uh, people, process, and technology? I can't stress enough the importance. Uh, healthy security operations, they, have, they rely on uh, um, having the right people in the right seat, uh, your analysts, your engineers, your forensics team, uh, unfortunately managers too. Uh, you should define uh, your processes, well document them, well rehearse them, define your runbooks to respond to incidents. Make sure you cover processes like uh, threat intel dissemination to your sensors, asset isolation, evidence gathering from allegedly compromised um, assets and then get the technology right. Uh, come up with a stack that works for your organization, sustainable, scalable, include the uh, classic IT sensors, IPS and EDR agents, include your cloud native sensors, Falco or whatever your cloud service provider uh, provides for you, CloudTrail or VPC flow logs in Amazon for example, and then um, stood up your security incident and event, and event management platform, or SIM, to collect all these logs and try to make sense out of them. And then, as we'll see later, introduce some automation, gently uh, maturing uh, your security response capability to try to take the humans out of the picture as soon as possible. Yeah, time out, Francesca, time out. Okay, we're not all hackers. Just, I had to do a little bit of research to understand what this guy was talking about. So for those folks who don't work in security all the time, yeah, just a few of the terms you're going to be hearing. So when we talk about an IOC, this is important. This is an indicator of compromise. So this is anything that sort of points to the attack. Yeah, this is kind of a useful thing. <laughs> this took a lot of Googling. Um, this is anything that will point to the sort of attack that's going on. So the, the, the malicious payload that's causing the, uh, the thing or like a, a syscall or disk access profile from like a, an owned workload, something like that. Um, the, if we say SOC, we mean the Security Operations Center, which is you know, the room where the people are sat with you know, eyes on glass, looking at all the information coming in, making decisions. Uh, a signal is any sort of security-related event that we monitor that, that comes into that room that those folks look at. And then yeah, we've got your SIEM, which is essentially your, your dashboard 
of all these security related events that are coming in so that humans can look at them and decide uh, whether they're you know real security incidents and, and what to do and then saw is essentially a workflow engine so it's essentially a, uh, a set of you know sort of scripted playbooks for automated responses that we've that we've practiced thank you Matt um, in terms of uh, existing frameworks to respond to incidents there are a few um, on um, out there uh, for this talk, we will use the, the NIST Instant Response uh, Framework. There is another one from SANS, which is quite, you find it quite often in uh, organizations. Um, the NIST Instant Response Framework uh, articulated over four steps. Preparation, you got your team, uh, the team, they have the right knowledge about the infrastructure and they're upskilled. And then you have your playbooks and runbooks defined. They are implemented and rehearsed. And then your, your technology and infrastructure is well observed. You have that observability right so that events come in into the security operations center. So step two is about detecting threats and analyze those threats. Once uh, uh, at the outcome of the analysis is basically um, label an event as a false positive or true positive and some variations in between. But overall, if it's a true positive, then you, uh, you move to step three. You move to contain the threat eradicate the threat from your environment and recover from it if there was a service, disrup service disruption. Step four, post incident activity. How this happened? How can we try to make sure it doesn't happen again? Again, just to do a little translation of this, because some of these terms are used in ways that I found a bit counterintuitive, I guess, as a, as a dev, not a security person. Um, yeah, so that detection step is watching for those signals in the, in the seam, as we talked about. Analysis is looking at the alerts or looking at the information that's coming through, trying to work out if it's a real incident and, and you know, working out, deducing those, those indicators of compromise. You know, what is the byte string that's being used to, to, to try to pop me uh, or how do I tell when a workload has been compromised? And what we're looking to actually produce at the end is, is one of these indicators of compromise, which is often a checksum actually of whatever the byte string is so that we can feed it into, say, a firewall and just have it blocked. Uh, containment is, is maybe a little counterintuitive. So when they say containment, they mean stopping the attack going further, kind of limiting its, its blast radius. So that does mean stopping privilege escalation, stopping lateral movement. Um, but it also means actually, this is where we would actually block the attack, right? So stopping the attack going further means stopping you know, other copies of the same workload falling fouled of the same exploit. So this includes the, you know, the, you might not see on this list, you block the attack. It, it's actually included in containment. It's maybe not obvious. Uh, eradication then says, okay, so we, you know, we blocked it. It can't, it can't move. It can't happen again. But we have had some things that have been compromised, so we have to go clear them out. That's eradication. And then recovery is about restoring the normal service because, and um, we'll, we'll come on to this, it's, it's important, it's sort of implicit in the NIST response framework is the fact that your response is going to involve kind of turning everything off, right? Panicking and shutting things down and, and cleaning, th re-imaging things. Uh, so recovery is about getting your normal level of service back. And a lot of what we're going to talk about is, is maybe ways to sidestep that and, and not have too much service disruption when you're responding to an incident. But that's what the recovery part means. It means turning all the Windows servers back on again. Correct. Thanks, Matt. So as I mentioned during the uh, agenda walkthrough, organizations at some point uh, recognized that um, the classic incident response process was a little reactive and uh, then they start moving or they recognize the need uh, to move into something more proactive. And um, so they introduced something called intelligence driven defense. So we dropped the 101 in our response capability and um, we start adopting something called kill chain perspective. Kill chain is a step-by-step approach that identifies and stops proactively enemy activity, implements intent-based response, behavior-based detection to get a step ahead of adversaries. Of course, to do that, uh, it's critical to have the right uh, intelligence, uh, such as indicators of compromise. But what is actually this kill chain I'm referring to? Well, it, what, it was broadly identified that attackers, to get to your crown jewels, they go through seven steps. Those seven steps captured in the cyber kill chain, reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and controls, and then actual actions on objectives. Um, but the tricky bit is that they have thousands of ways to perform each step, right? And as responders, we only have a finite amount of resources, unless you are a large organization, but still you have a finite amount of resources. Um, so uh, how do we deal with that? But thankfully, thankfully we, we don't have to because some organizations like Maitri came up with a great framework like ATT&CK, which consists of a taxonomy of uh, tactics and techniques uh, 
talking about technical stuff, um, that uh, attackers uh, implement uh, to actually breach your organization and again, get to that actions on objective, try to get to those crown jewels. Uh, it's completely open source, uh, a goldmine of information, again, to figure out how your most likely threats, the ones most likely to target your organization, are going to operate, and therefore how you can break that kill chain based on the tactics and how they implement it. Uh, so to summarize, intelligence-driven defense is all about one thing, knowing your enemy, which actually is not really a new thing, isn't it? Because, apologies for the heart of war quote, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, Sun Tzu, the auto war quote is, if you know the enemy and yourself, uh, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles, but also one of the greatest bands in the world uh, said the same, right? Know your enemy. So they, they, they have to be right. Uh, but how do you respond fast enough uh, to attackers to and, and to make sure you manage to break, to break that kill chain? Well, again, you don't. You get a computer to do it for you. So. Kill Chain actually introduced some, or required introducing something called SOAR, Security Orchestration Automation and Response. It's a platform uh, called a tech stack that enables organizations to collect data about security threats and respond to security events with little or no human assistance. Um, again, there are commercial uh, platforms, open source platforms. We are tech agnostic in this talk, so we won't mention anything. Of course, SOAR, to do that, requires access to your infrastructure, to a degree, via APIs, via service account, and this is also going to be the crux at the end of this talk. Right, to wrap up the boring part, uh, instant response challenges associated are, can get very complex, reaction time is critical, technology interoperability is a challenge, and sometimes you have to deal with limited automation. And this gets even worse when we are talking about cloud-native response, because it's relatively new. Uh, there is a, a skills gap in incident responding team. That's uh, inevitable. Uh, it's very fast-paced. It's really hard to get observability right, back to the point before. Um, and then you have to deal with uh, things like volatility, scaling, and so on. And it's also very difficult for security operations to integrate properly and in a non-disruptive fashion with uh, teams' practices, such as infrastructure provisioning and DevOps pipelines. However, let's look on the bright side, I guess. So how can uh, responding to incidents in a, in a cloud-native platform actually help us, right? Um, how can cloud-native technology be, be a bonus? So first of all, obviously, these platforms are more advanced. Uh, you know, they have a bunch of advanced capabilities uh, around, um, you know, they're, they're just a high level of abstraction. So they restart workloads, they, they auto scale workloads, they do all the cool, you know, Kubernetes stuff that we know about. So we've just got a lot more levers to pull. Um, in terms of automation, you know, they're, they're automatable, they're automated, these things were, they do a lot of things for us already out of the box. They're designed to be extended and to be automated. They've got nice APIs, they're sort of ergonomic to, to develop against. And then GitOps is actually, you know, pro probably not exclusively a cloud-native pattern, but definitely goes hand in hand. Uh, and this gives us our, our, a whole bunch of like tools in our toolkit that are really useful when we're responding to incidents. So if we do our response through GitOps, then we've got an audit trail of all the things we did, right? I mean, you know, a Git repo's a Merkle tree. Everybody loves a blockchain, so there's that. But it's also sort of it's it's deterministic, it's reproducible, it's declarative. It's just a nicer way of working, and it also uh, can be an advantage when it comes to the sort of privileged operations, right? So your, your script or your users don't need highly privileged access. Uh, all they need, need to do is commit into Git, and then you've, you know, you've got the audit log, you've got all the gating that you might need, any, any rigo that applies, and then you know, operators in a cluster will pick up uh, CRDs pertaining to exactly what they need to do, and they'll have exactly the minimal set of permissions to do them. So we can you know, split things out, and we can understand the operations uh, in a much more cloud-native way. So, the CNCF landscape is so big now, it's fractal, right? But there are, we, for this talk, we're going to be focusing mostly on Kubernetes and Istio. I think it's a pretty, pretty standard platform these days. So, you know, the benefits that Kubernetes gives us when we're, when we're building these platforms and responding to incidents is, as I said, the, the out-of-the-box behavior around rescheduling and recovering applications, that support for custom operators and for extensibility, uh, the not technically a Kubernetes thing, but obviously, you know, GitOps is, is a, a big deal these days. And then more tactical things like uh, support for hardened runtimes uh, in a first class way with a runtime class resource, support for ephemeral debug containers, uh, and then some more alpha stuff that's coming down the, the, the road, all of which we'll look at, like uh, the container checkpointing stuff. 
and then it, what Istio brings us is is sort of layer seven networking, right? So we're we're moving, we're lifting our application, our pod to pod communications into this layer seven network, where, where all of your application layer protocols are, are you know passed and understood. Um, so, you know, we, we got we can have full logging of any metadata of, of any bodies because the you know the proxy can can parse and understand what it's seeing on the wire, and that gives us fine grained control of the traffic, right? So rather than uh, you know, an old layer four firewall being programmed on, you know, five tuples, you know, source and IP of uh, support and IP of, of source and destination. We can instead put in firewall rules based on HTTP methods and, and headers and paths and all those kind of things. Um, and because we've got the sidecar, and this only does apply to the sidecar model, not ambient mode. Because we've got a sidecar alongside every workload, then you've got policy enforcement at every hop, right? So you've got that policy enforcement point, as the security folks would call it, uh, at every hop between applications. So this led us to, to thinking, right? Now, if we're on a cloud-native platform, what does that change about the way we might respond to incidents? So we looked at the NIST framework, and we've actually tweaked it in a couple of ways. And we've got a kind of new proposal, uh, copyright 2023, uh, a little twist, a little remix uh, of what you know, cloud-native incidents response might look like. And this is still a proposal. We're going to walk you through um, a, an incident response using this. So the couple of changes we've made is we've managed to add a, um, a constraint step at, at step two, so we'll, we'll come on to that. But that basically says that we can actually get in and start proactively trying to stop the attack. Remember, this is before the analysis. This is even before we've confirmed that there is an attack. We've just got some alarms going off that something suspicious is happening. So normally you wouldn't roll response at this point because response tends to be very disruptive and very slow. Uh, so you normally wouldn't do anything until you've confirmed the attack. But with the cloud native technology, we can do some quick and non-disruptive things to, to try to contain it. So I'll, I'll talk about that. And then this also makes the sort of recovery, as I've alluded to already, makes the recovery in step three optional, hence the, I couldn't quite fit option of, but we've got the brackets around it, makes this optional because if we can do this response without disrupting service, then there is no recovery to do. It's not always possible, but if, you know, if we can do that, it may look like a little thing, but this is actually a really big win. Uh, quick shout out uh, to something coming in May um, from our uh, long-term uh, uh, control plane friend Abdullah Garcia at uh, JP Morgan Chase uh, uh, will release a, a threat library called Kubernetes for SOC, again, to help uh, security professionals uh, and infrastructure teams to get the observability right. As it was fused then with uh, content from uh, uh, field experience from, uh, you know, distilled in control planes, internal threat libraries. Thanks. So that's step one, preparation. Like Francesco said, you've got to get your people, your process, your technology all in the right place. This slide belies a lot of work, right? Especially as we move move to a cloud native platform, we upskill our teams. But it's, yeah, assuming that's done. Um, so what would what would detection look like uh, in a sort of cloud native instance response? So we've still got people, you know, sat in the SOC looking at the seam, looking at all that information. A lot of that information now is going to come from Envoy because, it's, as I say, it's a sidecar to every workload. So it's going to be analyzing all the traffic, sending all the traffic logs into the seam, and it really is going to see everything that, that happens on the wire. So it's going to detect those anomalies, send them, uh, send them to the seam, and then, as I say, you know, this thing it requires a human step, but this is going to be flagging sort of unknown and suspicious behavior. Um, they're all, you know, we're still going to have a bunch of the traditional sensors, so we're still going to have traditional firewalls, maybe. We're still going to have like EDR, essentially, like intrusion detection on your host. You might have, you know, NDR, your classic traffic sniffer. There's a whole market now, right, of XDR products. So there's still all your classic sensors, but we're now also getting things like CloudTrail logs, like VPC log flows, and like Envoy traffic analysis. So all of this comes into the seam, a human eyeballs it, and if they think something's up, they escalate, you know, to the saw, and they start running those, those workbooks, those scripted responses. So containment, this is our sort of our first new step. So this is about, as it says, buying time, about preventative containment. So for the purposes of this walkthrough, I should have drawn a picture, um, but imagine we have a deployment of 10 pods, right? Uh, and one of those pods has raised the alarm. So one of those pods is, is doing something suspicious or is receiving suspicious traffic. And then there's another nine in this deployment. And the reason that's important is because, you know, they're almost certainly on the end of the same traffic route, right? So if I hit example.com slash foo, I'm getting, my requests are getting routed. If I hit that from the internet, my requests are getting routed to this deployment of, of 10 pods. You can do more complicated things in Kube, but let's pretend it's hitting my deployment of 10, and one of them has raised the alarm, but I know any future requests, you know, are gonna start hitting the other ones pretty quickly because the load balancer is just gonna be spreading those requests out. So what do we wanna do to that suspect pod? Um, you know, straight away, right? 
suspicious, suspicious activity, but no attack confirmed. Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to freeze the orchestration. We want to stop it getting, you know, uh, we want to stop it getting deleted, replaced, essentially. So we want to stop it getting scaled down. We want to stop it getting updated because we're going to want to go in and do some forensic analysis of this pod. So the very first thing to do is just tell the orchestrator to leave it alone. You know, it's, it's ours now. It's under investigation. And then the next thing we want to do is block the east-west traffic. So we want, we're going to stop, if it has been compromised, we want to stop that attack from moving laterally. We want to stop anybody from pivoting through this service into another one, right? So we want it to stop it being able to call anything else. But notice that I haven't said blocking north-south traffic, right? So we think, we think maybe an attack is in progress. We actually want to let it continue. You know, the payload may come in again. It may be a multi, it might be like a bug chain. There might be multiple stages to it. There's a whole load of reasons why we might want to see what's continuing to come in from this attacker on the internet. And actually, if it has already been popped, we want to see what's going out. So it's probably going to reach out to its C2 network. It's probably going to download the next stage of the malware. It's going to, maybe it's going to even start exfiltrating our data. All of that is stuff we want to see. So implicit in this is we actually want to leave that north-south traffic alone, but we want to block east-west so that people can't pivot through this. Uh, but notice that so that effectively does take this thing out of service, right? It's not going to be able to do anything useful for the user because it can't call your other microservices. But when we've taken it out of the deployment, it's going to have been replaced by Kubernetes. So our service level stays the same. Right, so how do we actually do this in a cloud native environment? I, you know, I've covered most of it. The, the easiest way to freeze the orchestration is to just remove that part from the deployment. I've shown, you know, literally shown the command here. You just want to change the label uh, that the deployment is matching. You just change it to something else on the, on the running pod, not in the deployment template, but on that one running pod. Change the label. In this case, I'm changing whatever it used to be foo to foo isolated. The deployment controller will then leave it alone. And as I say, first big cloud native win it will actually, it's actually not disruptive because the deployment controller will come and replace, it'll say, oh, I had 10 pods, now I've only got nine, and it'll, it'll bring a 10th back into life so that service level will be maintained. Um, I did say, tell Sir Hale, I would um, pronounce cube control in every possible way, this talk. So when you hear your preferred pronunciation, give us a cheer. So this would be cube control patch pod. I'm, I'm too old to say it like that. Um, <laughs> Right, so then we, the other thing we said we'd do uh, for this suspect pod is to block that east-west traffic. There's a few options for this. I had a slide that explained them all, but we ran out of time. So the one I chose was, you know, using, using the Istio service mesh, you're using the authorization policy resource, essentially the, the layer 7 firewall. There's a couple of things you've got to, because of the way Istio models things, there's a couple of things you want to do. So this is blocking any traffic into the pod. This is stopping anything from calling this pod that we think might have been popped. You do actually still want to do this, right? Because it could be acting maliciously, it could be poisoning data, it could be, it could be doing nasty stuff. So you want to block any calls into it. It's actually quite easy. You also want to block any calls out of it. You want to stop it calling anything else. So this is how you stop people pivoting through it, mostly. Um, that's not so easy with Istio because of the way their API models the world. Uh, I won't bore you with the details, but you end up, you need to end up basically doing something like this to tell everything else not to accept requests from it. So in terms of this proactive containment, what do we want to do to those other nine workloads, right? We think that deployment's under attack. We think they're probably going to get malicious payloads soon, but we're not sure if they're even malicious. We're not sure if these ever been compromised. But, you know, why not respawn in a hardened container runtime? Um, because another cloud native win, this isn't disrupted to our level of service, right? We, so a Gvisor or a cat containers or something, we maybe don't run everything under these all the time because there is a, there is a penalty to the performance of the app. There is a penalty to the, the CPU cycles and the RAM. So it's going to cost us more dollars and maybe add a little bit of latency. So we don't want to use it all the time, but if we think we're under attack, then, then why not? So why not just respawn everything in this, in this hardened runtime? Uh, so the way to do this, for example, using Gvisor um, is that you would kubectl uh, patch the, de the, the deployment, so the pod, tech, the pod template in the deployment uh, to change the runtime class name. This assumes you've got Gvisor installed and set up, um, but again, not disruptive if you've already got that stuff set up. And if you, if you have tested that your app runs on the, especially Gvisor, because it's a bit weird, uh, you can just go do this. Um, so this, you know, so that blocking of the east-west traffic, if you think your pod may have been popped, Blocking the east-west traffic stops it attacking other services, right, other microservices on the same level, and this stops it basically breaking, stops container breakouts, essentially, right, stops you pivoting onto the host, getting persistence on the host in the BIOS, like the really nasty stuff that you do not want to be dealing with. Uh, so this is about preventing that. So then we can come on to analysis, just getting a bunch of information. So with that suspect pod, we want to verbosely log 
the north-south traffic. Remember, we said we'd leave the north-south traffic flowing, but we want to crank the logging right up because we really want to see. We're going to let the attack continue, but we're trying to gather that indicator of compromise to know what our attack payload looks like so we can block it in the future. And as I say, if it has been owned, we want to like we want to gather the C2 addresses and the kind of stuff they're exfiltrating. So we want to verbosely log the north-south traffic. Um, we then actually want to pretty quickly checkpoint the container because everything else we're going to do, like looking at it with forensic tools, might be might be a bit uh, invasive, right? It might it might it might leave a trail because we you know we're hands on keyboard, we're like in the movies hacking red team blue team like hands on three keyboards. So we're being pretty quick. We might make a bit of a mess. Uh, so we actually probably first thing we probably want to do is take a checkpoint so we've got a clean image so we can analyze it more slowly later. And actually, if this is a serious attack and the authorities get involved, they're going to want this before we've got our fingers all over it. So checkpointing is super important. Um, and then we do want to just get in there with forensic tools and do some old style like looking around. So how would we implement that? The verbose uh, network traffic logging, again, there's a lot of options. They all kind of suck a bit. The one I ended up on was Envoy does not want to log every single header and the request and response bodies because that's not what it's for and that's very slow. Envoy just doesn't want to do it. The only way to make Envoy do it is to inject some custom code. Um, but luckily, we can do that now with the WASM plugins. They're really well supported. So this, there's a bit of config to do. This is the main resource. Basically, tells it to use a WASM plugin, um, body logger, um, WASM blob that we've made available. This thing, as far as I could tell, didn't exist, so I went and wrote it. Um, this is a little snippet. So this is the function, um, you know, Rust, memory, memory safe, security. This is the function that, um, that's going to log the request body. This thing also logs response bodies and all the request headers and all the response headers. Um, so that, as I say, that didn't exist, so I've written it. Uh, I won't tell the URL because it's, it's not finished. Um, but it does work, I proved the point. How do we implement those container checkpoints? Okay, well, this is supported, but it's super alpha. So Linux has had this checkpoint restore in user space um, thing for a while now. Apparently works fairly well, but support from Kubernetes is still very limited. So there's a cap out there about introducing this thing. Cryo supports it, ContainerD doesn't. They're still discussing it on a PR. Uh, there's just this like imperative API you have to hit on, on the runtime itself. Kube doesn't even expose it yet. So very alpha, but it's coming. The, the tech in the kernel, well, in the kernel, the tech in user space, the Cryo thing at Linux level seems to work. There's a bunch of references for anybody who wants to look into it. And then how do we do the forensics? How do we bring all these tools to bear? Well, the new-ish new ephemeral debug containers are a really good way of doing that. So we can Kube cuddle. Yeah. Oh, no. <sighs> OK. We can kubectl cube cuddle debug uh, to attach one of these ephemeral debug containers. Um, I'm using the BusyBox image here. You can use Kali or whatever. And importantly, to share the, because we've got two containers in this pod, right? because we've got the main app container and the Envoy sidecar, you actually need to target the main app container so that you share its process namespace. And then you can do things like you know, see smoking guns of malware. You can see like you know, the malware script that running. So that was analysis of the suspect pod. There's a lot we want to do to that because we think it's been owned. It's acting really suspiciously. What do we do with the other nine pods? Not a lot, but we probably, again, want to crank up the logging on their network traffic. You know, We haven't really done anything for them except for wrap them in GVisor just in case. But again, we think, as I say, we think you know, the load balancing is going to send the exploit at one of the other ones next, and maybe they'll get owned, and maybe they'll start calling out to C2. So we just want to crank up the logging um, on them instead. And the, you know, the implementation for that is exactly the same as before. It's your WASM filter. So we can now confirm, right, we got all this information. We got all this super detailed information. So a human in the SOC can go and kind of confirm a true positive. We, we know we're under attack. We've got indicator of compromise. We know how to tell when something's compromised and tell when it's being attacked. So what are we going to do about it? So we're now into containment. And remember, this is the NIST definition of containment. So this means stopping the attack going further, uh, including you know, stopping it happening again on, on other pods. So, so blocking it, which is right, the kill chain. That's the, yeah, with explosions and Michael Bay. Um, so how, do we do, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to reconfigure the, like, the firewall uh, and the WAF, right? fairly standard stuff. But your firewall, as I say, used to be a layer four thing, like blocking by IPs. Your firewall is now Envoy. You've got this policy enforcement point everywhere. Your firewall is Envoy, so it's a layer seven firewall. So I can block requests based on HTTP attributes like path and like method. If that's not in, so for like a log for shell attack, that's sufficient because that JDNI string is in a header. So I can just regex a header. I can tell Envoy to do that. If that's not sufficient, if we need to start matching like bodies, uh, then you're going to need a full WAF. Um, the, the reference one, I guess, is, is Caraza, which is a, an Envoy plugin. 
uh, which is a mod security re-implementation, basically, understands mod security rules. So this is how you'd block a body, this is how you'd do um, uh, like stateful, stateful tracking of HTTP request chains and stuff. Uh, and as I say, policy enforcement points are, are everywhere, so we can also block, if you've got one Java app that's been owned using log for shell and you think they're gonna to try to pivot onto you know, another Java app using the same attack, we can block that too, like we can block like those attacks east-west because it's not like we're just on a trusted subnet anymore, right? With no, you know, you're inside the core router, there's no enforcement. We've got policy enforcement points everywhere. Then we need to eradicate. So then we need to go and uh, identify those pods that have definitely been compromised and, and get rid of them. And remember, we've orphaned them for the deployment, so that's actually not too bad. And because the attack is blocked, we know it now can't reoccur, so we just need to go find all the places that, that have been popped and we just, need to, um, we just need to shut them down, basically. And you probably want to restart the remaining workloads just in case, because you knew you were under attack. You knew the attack was successful, so you, you probably want to recycle them. So how do we do the pods? Well, that's, that's, re that, that's really simple. I mean, this slide doesn't seem like it's saying much, but actually because Kubernetes is so automated, such a high level of abstraction, uh, and because we've already removed this thing from its deployment, nothing, nothing's gonna you know, uh, look after it, we can just, how many have I not left? Control. Kubernetes, so CLI Kubernetes, command. kubectl, have I not done that one? Yeah, Kubernetes CLI, um, you can have kubectl, uh, delete, delete pod. Because it, it should be like ioctal, right? Um, and then you might optionally want to recover. And as I say, ideally, big cloud native win, not needed. You know, what did we do? We removed uh, infested pods from the deployment. They got replaced. We stopped the rest of the deployment getting popped by blocking things really quickly, by running it under Gvisor. None of this, you know, even when we changed the runtime class of those other nine pods, that's a change to the pod template in the deployment. So it's done as a rolling update, right? Your pod disruption budgets are honored, your minimum scale are honored. So hopefully we did all of this with no disruption to service and like literally honored all of the like codified SLOs of like pod disruption budgets. But maybe you need to do something, maybe you need to go turn something back on. So it's worth having this on your checklist just in case, but hopefully probably not even needed. Uh, oh, right, so what's the implementation for that? Well, we need to restart them all, but we changed their runtime class. We actually had to change their service account to make the firewall work. So you know what? If we just put those values back, you're going to get another rolling upstart, uh, another rolling restart, sorry. So nice side effect. Everything gets restarted. <laughs> oh, I'll just quickly go through the last little bit. So I haven't really said, I've said what happens and why. I haven't really said how. You know, maybe it was in, maybe you were thinking a human was going to be doing this, typing really fast. ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT. Maybe you thought it was ChatGPT. Uh, that says a lot about whether you're under 25. Um, maybe you thought it was a saw run book, but actually saw run books aren't ideal because those, those that market hasn't kept up. That text pretty old, so none of them really have first class support for calling the Kubernetes API that kind of stuff. Uh, and you'd need to give your saw. So you probably end up writing custom plugins that are just curl commands, and you'd need to give all of that like cluster admin tokens, and it's not some horrible privileged access, and that's not good. Uh, so how can we, in a cloud native way, how can we automate this? So I wrote, again, as a proof of concept, definitely not finished, but I wrote this little response program. Um, so it generates the YAMLs and issues the commands that we would need to do this stuff. So a lot of that stuff I showed you was declarative. You know, you do that uh, with a, by deploying a resource, like the, um, like the authorization policy. A lot of them were imperative, like, well, I'm out of ideas now, kubectl, <laughs> kubectl delete, kubectl debug, right? Um, a side note, if there's any Kubernetes maintainers in the room, it would be nice if more things were declarative. Uh, why can't I make a debug container with a debug container resource, please? And then remove it by removing the resource. Uh, and why isn't container checkpoint a resource just like volume snapshot is? But anyway, some are imperative, some are declarative. Imagine I wrote a program that generated the declarative YAMLs and issued the imperative commands. Well, I did. Um, so here, it, and all it needs is the name of that deployment, right, that we think is under attack, and the name of, in this case, the one pod that we think has been popped. Uh, and it just, in the, you know, all I'm showing here is it, it, it's emitting the YAML. I haven't implemented every step that I talked about, but I proved the point. We implement some of the YAML. Um, so we can do that. But what's even, but that CLI is kind of one shot. You know, you get a bunch of YAMLs on standard out. You've got to go do something with them. It's going to issue those commands once, but if you get 429, you know, it's not going to try again. So wouldn't it be better if that was an operator, right? A long lived thing that can reissue those commands on a loop and make sure they work um, and uh, can sort of uh, can create and delete and modify the YAMLs in the cluster. So the obvious way to do this is an operator. So that input that it took, the deployment name and the pod name, and now fields in a CRD. 
So all the SOAR has to do, or the human has to do, is make the CRD saying, oh, this deployment's under attack, and I know that because this pod's showing suspicious behavior. Make that, write that into a CRD, commit it to Git. You know, it works with your existing CI pipeline, it fits into your existing you know, policy or authorization structure, you've got your audit log from the Git history of, of what we were doing, try to respond to this incident, and your SOAR doesn't need any access beyond the ability to do a Git commit, or maybe even just raise a Git PR that some security specialist then like merges. So when you can do that, then the CRDs will end up in the cluster through Flux, right? And they'll be picked up by this by the operator version. So response has got two binaries, one's a, one's a CLI, one's an operator. It'll get picked up by the operator that'll do the imperative commands on a retry loop, and it'll render out, it'll, it'll patch in the declarative resources. It's so a bit of a whirlwind, but I think that's really what we wanted to say. Uh, I think, yeah, introduction to Security 101, um, what that looked like in traditional infra, what it might look like in cloud native infrastructure, how you would do these things in cloud native infrastructure, and then actual implementation steps to prove that it all works. Did Indeed. I miss anything? Not at all. Cool. Sounds good. So. And a quick shout out to a book written by our control plane CEO, Andy Martin, Hacking Kubernetes, scan and download, please. Uh, it's a gold mine of information on how to secure, but also break Kubernetes clusters. It really and is. It's like if you've got a shell in a pod, like what's all the recon? What are all the vectors you can take to escalate privilege, move sideways, move up, move down? It's actually really, really good. I don't even work there. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much, folks, for showing up. And uh, I don't think we have time for questions, but we'll, we'll stay here for the rest of the day. So come over here. <laughs>